little local boy uh, from Starkville County. Riley uh, has a BA from Houghton College and his Juris Doctorate from uh, SUNY Buffalo School of Law. You and were planning on going back to Vietnam that this would ultimately lead into a book and to those three individuals, is that, is that the, there? The three individuals uh, came later in the process. Uh, mm -hmm. When I went back to Vietnam and came back, I did write an article for Naval History Magazine which was published in Naval History Magazine. Uh, but when I decided to take it the next uh, step, uh, I've, I felt, especially in the case of one of these men that had been where I was supposed to have been the night he was killed, I wanted to meet his kids, because his kids were left basically without parents after that happened. And uh, so once I tracked them down up in Michigan, or two of his daughters, then I decided, well, there's these other two families that I knew these gentlemen, and it would probably be fitting if I'm going to do a book to include them, not just in memory of them, but in the fact that it also describes the type of warfare going on in the Mekong Delta area in 1969 and 70. It sort of fills it out. And um, so it was a combination. You, you are quoted as saying that the life of a soldier can end in a second, but the pain of the family goes on forever. Could you kind of use that quotation and talk a little bit about the three individuals that you had, uh, Chief Tozer, uh, Jim Roast, and uh, just, Bob Olson? Just quickly, I will. They're in the book. Um, Chief Tozer is in the Navy on patrol boats like I was. And uh, one night when I was supposed to be assigned to a place we called Blood Alley because there was a lot of action there, I got reassigned at the base camp that night, and he went out and took my place. And he was killed that night. Mm -hmm. The guy that drove the boat didn't put him in for the Silver Star. Uh, he received it. Uh, but I watched the chief die. I talked to him before he died. And uh, I, I, didn't, I don't think I told him that night, but it's sort of in my heart I said, I better try to reach out to his family because his wife had died just like three months earlier in a car accident in San Diego. And so the kids were raised as orphans, uh, then by family members. and. It's not a happy story, but you know some of the stories of war are not happy. A lot of them aren't, and uh, the legacy of what happens uh, is important. Uh, in the case of uh, Bob Olson, he was an Army guy I met on patrol. He was a wild guy in a way. He very, but I, I wrote a, a chapter on him called Warrior because that's what he was, and he was good at it, and he made my life safer because he was so good at it. And uh, his, he left a, a, a young daughter that I did not meet, but I met his widow in Phoenix. And then I wanted to visit his grave site, so she comes up to Iowa once a year and at Memorial Day, and I met her in Iowa at his grave. And then Jim Rost, who was a little bit younger than I was and in the Navy, he was killed one night, Never was not married, uh, but had uh, a large uh, family, Irish Catholic family from Long Island. And uh, I went down and met with the three of his uh, siblings there, the, the fourth I met by mail. Uh, he, he sent in uh, some comments he wanted to make. So they all had, uh, you know, family connections and uh, different types of family connections. But you meet people, one of the things I say in the book is, and people have been in the military, there's some here tonight who were in Vietnam, you don't have to know anybody very long, especially if you're in a combat type situation, to become friends. Uh, you're dependent on each other. And uh, so in the last guy, Jim Ross, that I mentioned, one of the things that was interesting about my friendship with him is that he was planning on going into the Catholic priesthood and ended up not going, in, going to engineering school. I was in a Methodist seminary. I came this close to going, becoming a minister in the Methodist church. So when we would get together in the beer barge to talk about the war and politics and stuff, we'd end, end up a lot of times speaking about, <laughs> speaking about theology. You're not allowed to have beer or booze in, in the Navy. Uh, the British are more enlightened. They have spliced the main brace and they get the brandy out pretty regularly, but not in the U.S. Navy. Except you could keep it under lock and key, and then if you got to a place where you could play softball on the beach, they put the mortar whale boat off the ship, you go into the beach, got, bring a cold beer along and have a nice beach party. Uh, but um, what happened then uh, up, up on the Cambodian border is that we had a, a huge barge that was air conditioned, it had officers country, enlisted men's quarters, food, air conditioned, you could get a fresh uniform, it felt great, get a shower. And somebody came up with the idea that if Although it was illegal to have beer on 
the barge, the big barge, if somebody else tied up a barge next to the big barge, <laughs> and, and the Navy did not own that barge, it was okay. So the men got together, put a few bucks together, somebody bought a barge, we brought it up, tied it up next to the YRBM 20, and every night at 6 o'clock they'd say beer call and everybody would flow off the barge, the, the, the ship of the Navy onto this little thing that had a little hooch on it, we used to call it, had an air conditioner in it and a freezer full of beer, or a fridge full of beer. So we had a lot of great discussions there. It was a great time to get to know people. And uh, there was a lot of intermixing of enlisted and officers in a situation like that as there was on patrol, so that was good. Two, two Trung Van, uh, I trained them on these boats. And we became good friends. And before I left Vietnam, he'd taken me to have dinner with his parents in Saigon. In 1975, Jane can remember this, we got a phone call, we're getting, getting ready to go to bed at night, and it was a, it was a uh, church world service person. She said, I think this is for you. I picked up the phone. They were calling from Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. They said, we are a refugee center. Do you know a two-trung van? I said, yes, I do. He said, he'd like to speak with you. Can he, we arrange a time tomorrow? Two was with his family. He had escaped that night. He went back to his base, and the Navy guys that were fighting in the, south, in, in the Mekong Delta, the Vietnamese Navy people, did not realize the war was over. The Army people that were running the war, the South Vietnamese Army, hadn't told them anything. And their commander called me and said, we just were notified that in three hours we're surrendering to the North Vietnamese in Saigon, and we don't think it'll be good, especially for officers, to stay in this country. And so we're going to take off in small boats, and we have a couple destroyers in the, in the South China Sea. Two got his family, went there, finally got to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. And uh, this town, here's to Jamestown, First Presbyterian Church sponsored he and his family. They came here. The General Hospital, which was still around then, he got a night watchman's job at the General Hospital. He went back and got his two-year degree at JCC. The weather was tough, though. <laughs> and he, remember 77? Yeah, we remember that. We had it again this year. Uh, he went down and got his last two years of education in Jacksonville, and he's now retired from having a 25-year career at Shell Oil and lives in Dallas. But he was back visiting his mom and arranged this trip for me to go back in 2010. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful story of a friendship made in never having thought it would go much more than a year there in Vietnam. It ended up being a lifelong friendship. Would you do the book again? If I could do it in two years instead of four, maybe. <laughs> so I, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I guess I would do it again. Um, I mean, the one thing I, I would just say that um, the families of these three guys that were killed that I write about have sent some wonderful testaments to appreciating the fact that this is recorded. What their next of kin were doing when, before they were killed in Vietnam and the life that they had just before they were killed. And, um, so I, uh, I, I've appreciated those letters. I mean, the, the book, I uh, highly recommend you, you will enjoy reading because it's a terrific odyssey. It's Raleigh's story, and it's also a very spiritual story. And you quote, quoted as saying, death is a great mystery, but its presence gives a new dimension to life. Life is so temporary, yet at the same time so eternal. I mean, that's pretty profound stuff, Riley Kidder. Sounds like an ex-seminarian, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would end the book with a chapter called Requiem. And I, how was I going to end this, this story? I went and visited the graves of each of these guys. And they're buried near their hometowns. And then I'm in Washington quite a bit with the things I do, and so I took pictures of the name on the wall, Vietnam Wall, and I put them in three different sections and I said, well, what am I going to write about now that I've figured out this is what I want to do? And I remembered when I sang in the church choir, and I called Marilee Schmidt, who was our choir director. I said, Marilee, what about that Mozart Requiem? Oh, yeah, it's a great, I said, I remember singing that. And she said, well, you can go online and get the words for it. So I, I incorporated Mozart's Requiem uh, in the last chapter um, to sort of wrap it up, I guess you might say. So, but uh, thank you for reminding me of, of that side of things. Yeah. Thank you Thank for coming. You. Thank you.